Brian D is here. So. Wow. Okay. Wow. Wow. Yes, yes. <laughs> Okay, so let's begin with uh, a few kapitlach of Tehillim for our brothers and sisters in Eretz Yisrael, all the soldiers and all those in captivity, all of their families and all of the wounded. We'll say kapit. We'll begin with uh, today. Of course, is Rish Chodesh, Rish Chodesh Nissan. So those who say Tehillim every day over the month, we begin today the Tehillim. So we'll say from the beginning of Tehillim, the first uh, two kapitlach. Aleph, Ashrei ha'ish ashe lo'i halach ba'atzas rishoyim, uvederech ha'toyim lo'i omad, uvamershav leitzim lo'i yashav, kiyim b'seris ha'denai cheftzai, uvseirasa yege yoyman v'loyla. V'hoya ke'ez shosel al palge mo'yim, asher piri yitin b'itoi v'aleyu lo'i yibol v'choyla sheyasa yatzliach, Loichain Horishoyim Kiim Kamoitz Asher Titfenu Ruach Alkain Loyuk Alkain Loyukum Urushoyim Bamishpot Vachatoyim Badas Sadikim Kiedeya Dinoi Derech Sadikim Vederech Rishoyim Toyved Bez Lomo Rok Shugoyim Ulu Umim Yagurik Isyatsvu Malchayer Ez Verozdim Verozdim Noizdu Yochad Al Adinoi Vaal Meshichoi Nenatkas my sre se moi, Vinashlicha me menu ave se moi, Yoishev bashamayim yishok adino yil aglomoi, Oz ye daber e lemoi va apoi, va haroi no ye va lemoi, Vanino sachti malki alci in her cochi, A saprel hoi kadinoi, omare lai bni ato, Ani hayoi miliditiho. Shaal mi meni ve etna goyim nachalosacho, Vachuzos ha afse yoretz, Tiroyim beshevet barzel kichli yoitzer tenapzeim, Vaata malochim haskilu, he was ru shoifte yoretz, Evdu was adinoi beyido vigilu birodo, Nashkuvar pen yenaf, Visoivdu derech kiyivar, kimat apoi ashre. And the last capital, all the way at the end, Kufnun. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bekotchai. Hallelujah. Brikio Uzai. Hallelujah. Big Vuraisov. Hallelujah. Kirov Goodloy. Hallelujah. Beseka Shaifar. 
Hallelujah, Benevel Vechiner, Hallelujah, Besefer Machel, Hallelujah, Beminim Vyuga, Hallelujah, Tiltele Sham, Hallelujah, Tiltele Srua, Kailane Sham, Tahalalia, Hallelujah. We'll say one more capital, Kufchav Bez. Kufchav Bez 122. Kufchav Bez. Shir Hamalos Ladovit, Samachti, Boim Nimli, Bez, Adenoi Nelech. Oim doi sayur agleinu bishara yich Yerushalayim. Yerushalayim abnuyo ki yir shechubra lo yachdov shesham alu shvatim shifteya. Eidus li Yisrael ha'eidus l'shem adinoi. Ki shama yashvu chisais l'mishpat. Kisais l'veiz David. Shalu shloim Yerushalayim yishloyu oyavayich. Yehi shalom bechelech shal v'barmanois hayich. Laman achai vireya yadabra no shalom bach. Laman beis adinoya lehenu avaksha tevloch. Welcome everybody. There's one source sheet that's double sided on the bima if you didn't get it yet. Next week there will be a class, Be'ezer Hashem as well. That's next Tuesday, 9 30. And today and next week we will be exploring Pes- Pesach themes. Since today, of course, is Rosh Chodesh Nissen, the first day of the month of Nissen, Agat Chodesh to each and every one of you, and Agat Yom Tov, Kashen Afrelech and Pesach to all of you, B'Tach Klal Yisrael. So this week and next week, Be'ezer Hashem will be dealing with Pesach. Today's class is dedicated by Liz and Dr. Michael Michelle, in loving memory of Liz's mother, Mrs. Shirley Levy, Sarah Pessel, Bas Reb Aryeh Leib, on the occasion of her fifth yard site, on the 22nd day of Adr Shani, she and her husband were from the pillars and founders of the Munsi community, Tehei Shmasat Surah, B'Tzir HaChayim. May she remain an eternal source of blessing and light and inspiration for her children, all of the descendants, the entire family, the entire community, and all of the Jewish people. Amen. Thank you very, very much. <clears throat> If you take a look at your source sheet, we begin with a uh, with a quote from the Haggadah. It's probably one of the most famous passages of the Haggadah of Pesach, and uh, it's extremely well known and entrenched in Jewish tradition. And it's said almost in the beginning of the Seder, after the Manishtan, after the four questions, and the first few passages afterwards. The Haggadah continues and says this statement, and you have it in the Hebrew and in the English. Many people sing it. Baruch Hamakayim Baruch Hu, Baruch Shenasan Torah Lami Yisrael Baruch Hu. Kenegad Arba Banim Dibre Torah Echad Chachem Echad Rashav Echad Tam Echad Sheni Yidei Elisha. Translation: Blessed is Hamakayim. Hamakayim is one of the titles we use to describe Hashem. Makayim literally means place, the space. So it's usually translated as the omnipresent one, the one who fills every space. As Chazal say, Hu He constitutes the space of the world. Like we say, Baruch Kvayd Hashem Mim Kaimai. So Baruch HaMakayim is, blessed is the omnipresent one, the one who fills the space. Baruch Hu, blessed is He. And then we do again, Baruch Shnos and Torah Lama Yisrael. Blessed is the one who gave the Torah to His people, to Yisrael. Blessed He. And we continue, the Torah speaks of four children. Kenegad Arba Banim, four different children the Torah speaks about. One is the Chacham, one is wise, one is Rasha, rebellious, one is Tam, means either simple or complete, whole, and one is Sheni De Elishal, does not know how to ask. That's the passage in the Haggadah. Before we go further, one wonders the connection between the two parts of the sentence. Baruch HaMakim, Baruch Hu, Baruch Shnaz, and Torah Yisrael, Baruch Hu, it's nice, we're blessing Hashem. And right away, in the same paragraph, now we start talking about the four children. What's the connection between the two things? If you want to dedicate the passage to thank Hashem, okay, let's do that. And we, right away, we start talking about the four children. It seems two completely uh, different messages, different themes, disjointed. And yet the Haggadah puts them together in the same paragraph, the same passage, the same sentence. There's also four baruchs, if it's interesting. <laughs> I'm already giving away the answer. There's four baruchs in the passage. <laughs> it's also interesting. Blessed is Hamakim, Baruch Hu, Baruch Shnazan Tarlam Yisrael, Baruch Hu. You could say Baruch Hamakim, 
Shinasan Tayr Lama Yisrael, if you want to finish, Baruch Hu. But we see it says four times Baruch. And each time it's for something else. First you bless the Makai. Then you say he's blessed. And then you say blessed is the one who gave Tayr. And then you say again he's blessed. Baruch Hu twice in the beginning and the end. And then uh, Baruch Hu, you have the Baruch HaMakim in the beginning. And then Baruch Hu is number one. Baruch bar, number two. Baruch Shnasan Tayr number three. And then Baruch Hu again. Why is Baruch Hu repeated twice? What's the significance of this? So right away you see that God is trying to say something and uh, one has to understand what, what exactly is the message. Another interesting thing is when he speaks about the four children, usually you say, On each one he says the word Echad. One is a Chacham. One is a Rasha. Usually if you're mentioning four, you say, I'm going to talk about four children or four things, whatever you want to talk about. And you go, one, two, three, four, or this, and this, and this, and this. Here, before each one, he uses the word echad. As though each one is number one. <laughs> echad chacham. One is the chacham. Ve echad rasha. One is the rasha. Ve echad tam. Ve echad sheni yedeh What's the significance of that? Where do we have this concept of keneged arba banim dibre tayre? The Agada says, the tayre speaks of four children. What does the Haggadah mean that the Torah speaks of four children? I should say this text from the Haggadah comes from the, it's known as the Mechilt, it's one of the early Midrash and one of the early uh, texts of Torah Shabal Peh, of the oral tradition, commentaries on Chumash Mais. As much of the Haggadah comes from there and different sources. So the truth is that the origin of the four children or the four sons, the Arba is fascinating. Because if you look through the whole Torah, if you look through the whole Chumash, you see that there's four different places in Torah, four times, that the Torah addresses our duty to tell the story to our children. Three of them are in Parsha's boy, in the Parsha that deals with the story of the Exodus of Egypt. Right after the actual Exodus story, they have three of them. The fourth one is only at the end, at the end of the 40 years in the desert, it's in Parsha's Vashana. Let's see these four sources. The first one, you have it in the source sheet, Parsha Aleph, let's call it, is Shmois Yud Beis Chafei, Exodus 12, 25. This is Parsha's Bay. And this is Moshe Rabbeinu speaking to the Jewish people before the Exodus of Egypt, and he tells them, Moshe says, one day you'll come to the land that Hashem gives you, and you will observe all this avoider, this ceremony, and your children might say to you, what is this avoider that you're doing? What does this work mean to you? And you should tell them the story. So here we clearly, Moshe speaks about the fact that your children will ask something, they'll tell you something, and you should respond to them. A little later, just one chapter later, Shmois Perik Yid Gimel Pasuk Ches, Exodus, Chapter 13, verse 8, the end of Parshas Boy, Moshe speaks to the Jews after they left Egypt, and he says, On that day, tell your child, I do this because of what Hashem did for me when I came out of Egypt. Here again, he's talking about the fact that you should talk to your child. And then, just a few verses later, Exodus 13, 14, the days to come, if your child asks you, what does all this mean? What is this? And tell him with a mighty hand, Hashem brought us out of Egypt, out of the land of bondage, of slavery. So here again, he speaks about the fact that your child will ask you a question. And then the last one is in Dvarim, in Deuteronomy. Perik Vav Pasach Chav, Deuteronomy 620. When your child might ask you tomorrow, what is the meaning of all of the stipulations and the decrees and the laws that Hashem commanded you? Tell him, I'll tell your child, We were slaves to fire in Egypt and Hashem brought us out of Egypt with a mighty arm. So here we have clearly in Chumash, Moshe Rabbeinu telling the Jewish people four times in four different places about the child asking a question and you responding. The first time he says, when your child will say X, Y, and Z, this is what you should say. The second time he says, you should tell your child on that day this. The third time when your child asks you, and the fourth time again when your child asks you. So the sages wanted to know, why does this say four different times? 
Why four different verses, four different times, again, three in Bai, one in Vaschanan? What's the significance? And therefore they concluded, Keneged Arba Banim Dibra Torah. The Torah was not talking about one child. If it was talking about one child or one type of child, it would say once. The reason it says in four, it's four different times, and in four different verses about talking to the child is because Keneged Arba Banim Dibra Torah. That's the meaning of the Gal. Now we understand very well that what's that this. Moshe is communicating four distinct passages, talking to four distinct children. That's why you need it to be said four different times, because it's four different children. Each one has a different need, or a different question, or a different dilemma. And therefore, we address them in four different ways. So this became the basis for the Arba Banim, for the four sons of the Haggadah, because when we're sensitive to nuance, they understand that Moshe is addressing not one type, but four different types of children. So what essentially is the Haggadah telling us? The Haggadah is telling us that we have to speak to each of our children, but we can't speak in the same way, with the same language, to every single child. Each child requires the individual language that relates to his or her disposition, composition, questions, dilemmas, challenges. So, already 3,300 years ago, the Torah is articulating here that the story of Mitzrayim, the story of the redemption, needs to be communicated in four different passages. Four different responses, four different answers, four different ways addressing four types of children. And from here, the sages went on and say, who are these four types of kids? Who are they? We have four, but what do these four mean? On this, the Haggadah says... Moshe Rabbeinu doesn't clearly say which child he's talking about in each one. So this is where the Chachamim, our sages, came in and they said, let's explain. One is the Chachim, one is the Rasha, one is the Tam, and one is the Sheni Yedei Elisha. When you look at the words of the Agad, the Kenegad Arba, Banim Dibra, Tari, Echad Chachim, Echad Rasha, Echad Damir, Echad Yedei Elisha, if we listen to their words, we see that they're addressing and they're telling us four points. Four points about all four children. I guess we're very into the number four in the Agad. Number one, that God is saying, you're not dealing with one child. You're dealing with four different types of kids. What works for one may not work for the other. That's rule number one. Rule number two, all of them are our children. <laughs> That's number two. They're different, but they're all our ba'abonim. They're all our children. They're not strangers. With some children, we feel kinship because they naturally maybe remind us of ourselves in a good way, hopefully. And uh, they maybe even crowd, proudly carry that banner. So it's sometimes easy to look at a maybe not easy, but sometimes it's painful to look at a child. And as a mother once told me, I don't know where these children were born. I don't know who raised them. I don't know where, which, house they, which house they grew up in. <laughs> and I told them, your house. <laughs> Believe it or not. So the Haggadah is telling us they're four, but they're all children. They're not strangers. None of them, in other words, can ever, ever be written off, alienated. Number three, the Haggadah is saying, the Torah addresses all of them. The Torah does not speak to one genre of children, one group of children. It speaks to all of them. In other words, the Torah has a message or messages relating to each one of the children. If we cannot find the words for each of the children, it's because we're not accessing the full spectrum, the full wisdom of the Torah. Number four, the Torah's message to each child is distinct. You can't speak the same words to two children. So the Haggadah, in a very, very brief one-liner in its own inimitable way captures four of the most important truths about mentorship, about education, about pedagogy, about molding a future generation, creating the Jewish tomorrow. In one little line, not such a little line, one powerful, brief, concise line, we have here compact these four messages. Number one, we have at our table four different type of children. Four, of course, is a number. It could be eight, it could be 12. And as we will see in each one, you can have many types. 
Number two, but they're all children even though they're different. Number three, the Torah has a message for all of them. And number four, that message is not the same. It's unique. Now the question is, why four? <laughs> why not three? Why not six? Why not five? Why not seven? Four obviously is an important number here. And why are they so central to the experience of Pesach? And their question so important. And the answer obviously is because these four represent prototypes. Of course, once you get into details, you have many more than four. But these four represent what you would call archetypes, uh, tiposim, prototypes of different categories, of different ways of thinking, different operating systems that people have. And here the Haggadah starts getting into the question of each child and how we should address them. And what we want to learn today, Be'ezer Hashem is, after this introduction is, to be able to see how each child is asking a question that represents a fundamental approach that sits in a person's heart or in a person's mind. And how the Haggadah carefully constructs a response. Once we understand this, we can now go back to really appreciate why it's introduced with Baruch HaMakam, Baruch Hu, Baruch Shosan Baruch Hu. And this is very, very sensitive. As I already said in the preview, it says Baruch four times. Not a coincidence. Four times Baruch, paralleling, paralleling the four children. In other words, it's not just, when you read the Haggadah superficially, it looks literally <laughs> that it's things that are disjointed, just put together. Okay, let's bless Hashem. Oh, we blessed Hashem. Let's talk about the four kids, the four children. Ma shaykhut, what's the shaykhs? No, no, it's very carefully orchestrated. We're saying four times baruch. Each baruch parallels another child. Baruch hamakayim is for the first child. Baruch hu, for child number two. Baruch shenosan tayyelam Yisrael, child number three. Baruch hu, child number four. We now understand why it says four times Baruch. And here we come to a very sensitive truth. And that is, can you really be grateful for each of your children? Of course, it's easy to say yes. But deep down in a person's heart, do you sometimes wish, you know, you could replace. <laughs> and even if it's not in your best day that you make that wish, but sometimes we have hard days. And even if deep down you're grateful for each of the children, but sometimes pain or anxiety or pressure or the burdens of life can eclipse that truth. And eclipsing, as we saw yesterday, an eclipse doesn't mean that the sun is eliminated, thank God. The sun is still healthy and alive and well. The ancient pagan uh, populations believe that a, a solar eclipse, uh, the Chinese believe that the sun is poisoned <laughs> and it's about to die. <laughs> Or a dragon is eating up on it. What a very interesting uh, truths. <laughs> Judaism always knew you'll never have an eclipse that's not Rosh Chodesh. The beginning of the month or the end of the month. Because the definition of an eclipse is that the moon passes between the sun and the earth. And that happens every single Rosh Chodesh. So why don't we have an eclipse every Rosh Chodesh? That's because the orbit is tilted a little bit. So therefore it usually doesn't block the moon. It just blocks our vision of the moon. It usually doesn't block the sun. It blocks our vision. But in ancient cultures, they thought, you know, the sun is being poisoned. How did I just get into this? Oh, eclipse. When something is eclipsed, it's not eliminated. It's just dark. You don't see it. Maybe for a few moments, maybe for a few hours. So the Haggadah is telling us that in the night of Pesach, when we sit down, and this is right in the beginning of the Seder, it's a time to really be able to look at each child and say, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Four times thank you. And that's a very deep inner discovery in a person. That's deep work in a person. Thank you is not an external thank you, saying the right thing to make everybody feel good. It's also nice to do that, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about a shift in consciousness where the person reaches a place in themselves, in their own soul. First and foremost, the father and the mother. But every single one of us, in terms of our own relationships with our loved ones and with ourselves, to be able to say for each one of them, thank you. And it's not the same thank you. And that's what makes it genuine. If I'm saying thank you to four people exactly the same way, it means it's just a generic thank you. You know, thank you everybody for doing beautiful stuff. 
The fact that the Baruch is repeated four times is because it's all about emotional attunement. Isn't that nice? So it's four different Baruchs. You don't say thank you. I was looking for feedback, but it's fine. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Each baruch is different because that's what attunement means. Attunement means I'm attuned to the uniqueness of what this person brings into my life, what this child brings into my life. The way you enrich my life is not the way someone else enriches my life. And that's why the baruch changes. There's baruch hamaka. That's one baruch. That could be said about the chacham. What about the rasha? Baruch hu. It's a different baruch. What about the tam? Baruch shenos and tayr lami yisrael. It's a different baruch. Sheni yedeh elishal. Again, we go to baruch hu. So the four baruchs belong right in the beginning of this passage. Don't talk about the four children before you can't be thankful for each of them. Because if I talk about the four children or to the four children, before I feel my gratefulness for them, my message will be saturated with anger or with resentment or with negativity or with subtle alienation or with projecting different type of pain that I'm feeling, which is not really tuning into the child but rather tuning in to my own wounds that I'm dealing with, that I have to address, but it's going to hamper my communication in a very authentic way because the focus is me, not you. So that's why before you speak about the four children, first the Haggadah says, Baruch HaMakim, Baruch Hu, Baruch Shnosan Tarilam Yisrael, Baruch Hu. Now, let's go into these children and how we speak to them. And that's why the Baruch is so different because it's really finding how each one is a blessing. And the way each one is a blessing is in a completely different fashion than the way the other one is a blessing. And as we know, blessings come in many, many different forms and many different fashions. But each one helps us. Each one helps us find ourselves and each one helps us grow in our own unique way. And when we look at it from that perspective, one can really say that each child makes you into the person you're supposed to become and leaves their impact and makes their contribution, especially on mom and also dad, if they're open to it, to really go on that journey that every soul needs to go. So it's a relationship of mutual growth. Obviously, parents who are dedicated and caring help their children grow, but it also works the other way around. In fact, the last prophecy of the last Navi, the last Navi in Tanakh is Malachi. The last Sefer of Tanakh is Malachi. Malachi was the last prophet recorded in the Tanakh. He lived in the beginning of the second Beis Hamikdash. You had the group of Chagai, Scharia, and Malachi. This was the group of the Anshei Knesset Agdoila, the 120 um, member, the 120 sages who rebuilt Judaism after the destruction of the first Beis Hamikdash, when they went back and rebuilt the second Beis Hamikdash. Mordechai was in that group, Chagai, Scharia, Malachi, Ezra. The last one was Shimon HaTzadik. That's why we say in Pirkei Ovis, Shimon HaTzadik, Hoya, Mishyare, Knesset Hagdoyle. He was the last surviving member of this group of Antje Knesset Hagdoyle. So the last prophet was Malachi. And what's his last prophecy? Veheshev, Lev Avais, Albanim. Which means, Veheshev, he will return, Hashem will restore the heart of the parents al banim on the children. What does it mean on the children? So it actually says al yidei banim through the children. Veheshev lev aves al banim al yidei banim. So the last prophecy, isn't that fascinating, is that parents obviously mold and affect and impact and love and nurture their children, but it also works both ways. Veheshev lev aves al banim through the children, the parents can also do tshuva, can also return. Veheshev comes from the word return can be restored, can be healed, can be repaired. One said, I once saw a very powerful insight that, uh, you know, we all know in the Jewish home, in the Jewish tradition, we hide the Afikaiman. The, the section of the Afikaiman, that God is called Tzafun. Right? You have Mara, Kairach, Shulchan, Eirech, Tzafun. Beirach, Halal, Neritzah. What's Tzafun? Tzafun means hidden. Lahatspin in Hebrew is to hide. Why is this section called Tzafun? The answer is because the Afikaiman is hidden. Somehow the Afikaiman is hidden, it's put away. We do yachats, we break the matzah, and then we hide that larger piece of matzah. In the Jewish tradition, though, we're not the ones who find it. The children go and they find the Afikaiman where you put it away, and then they're the ones who have to give it to you. And usually they want a prize. When I was a kid, there was a bag of chips or a black and white cookie, 
And if you were Rothschild, a Rockefeller, maybe a Parker pen or a calculator. Today it's more like a Lamborghini or a private jet or a private yet, yacht. And if not, you can be deemed, you, they can call child services for your uh, complete being out, of, uh, out for lunch. But what is the meaning of this? I mean, it, you know, so, uh, why not make a little excitement? You know, they say they can get long and people can fall asleep, so we make a little excitement. But the truth is every minute at the Seder has very, very deep spiritual roots. There's a profound message here. And that is what this minute, what this tradition is teaching us is that whatever we hide in life, our children are going to reveal. What we store away, <laughs> we hide under the couch and we uh, relegate to secrecy, consciously or unconsciously, the children reveal it, they expose it. They bring it to the fore. They bring it to light. We all have a broken matzah. Everybody has a yachatz. Everybody's matzah. Everybody has a broken matzah. Show me a person who doesn't have a broken matzah and I'll show you a person who's not fully present in this world. We all have a broken matzah. But that broken matzah, we hide. Either we, in English, there's two words, suppress or repress. You can look up the difference. It's different. One is conscious and one is unconscious. But the bottom line is it gets hidden. At some point... Those, our children are going to reveal the Afikaiman. And when they reveal the Afikaiman to us, we can do one of two things. We can either get very upset at them. <laughs> How dare you? I have invested years, maybe decades, maybe together with my ancestors, we invested centuries in hiding this broken matzah. It was under a pillow and another pillow and another pillow and another pillow. How dare you? Chutzpinyak. They still use that word? Okay. What's the feminine for chutzpah, is there? It's the same. Chutzpah is the same. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> it's a masculine midah. How do you have the chutzpah? <laughs> no feminine word. No feminine word for it. Even the chutzpah itself is feminine. Chutzpah. Hey, come, it's hey at the end. <laughs> it says in Gemara, Be'ikvus Meshich chutzpah yazgi. Before Meshich comes to be a lot of chutzpah. How do you have the chutzpah? How do you have the audacity? Who gave you the right to expose the Safikaima? And then what I do is I get more upset, I get more angry, I get more resentful. And it's a response that's understandable. But what we're learning is that there's also another alternative. The other alternative is to be able to thank my child and accept the Afikaima and thank them for bringing this to my attention. And then I can internalize the Afikaima and then. Together we can declare Lashana Haba Birushalayim. We can go on a march to redemption. Because before we eat Afikaiman, we can't finish the Seder. The Afikaiman is the last thing that we eat as we conclude the Seder. So if I can actually embrace that Afikaiman and say, Wow, wow, thank you, thank you, thank you. Baruch Hamakim, Baruch Hu, Baruch Shanazan Tayyam is all Baruch Hu. Now the Afikaiman not only is becomes part of our life, it actually concludes. The meal at the Seder, as we're going to see soon what we tell the Ben Chacham, and then we can together declare Lashana Babir Shalayim. So that's why the Haggadah introduces these four Baruchs, this ability to be grateful, and that requires sometimes a paradigm shift, where it's not anymore about me controlling things, and my ego needing things to look a certain way, and maybe it's even a holy ego. It's a, ego is not necessarily this sadistic, sin, sinister ego. Sometimes ego is, I would call it a religious ego, or a, it's a halika ego. I don't know, I just made up a phrase. It's a spiritual ego. A spiritual ego means it's for good reasons. It's not, I'm not upset for bad reasons. I'm not, I'm not trying to be narcissistic and, and, and gluttonous and self-serving. I'm actually thinking about the benefit of my children. It's still called an ego because I'm thinking about the benefit of my children the way I want it to work out so that I should be able to tell myself I did my job, I'm a good mother, I'm a good father, I have nachas. And sometimes it robs me or it robs us from the ability to really tune in to the unique journey of my child's soul. And it's a very, very deep paradigm shift. It's not an easy paradigm shift because the two can be blurred very easily. You know, this, this boundary can be blurred easily because... Every normal parent loves their child and every normal parent wants their child to succeed. To say that it, parents are, are just selfish and self-serving, it's firstly wrong and it's, it's, it's off the mark 
and it's dismissive and it's also disrespectful. You're talking about mothers and fathers who would, if I could say so, take a bullet for their child. They would die for these children. So to say, oh, they're just selfish parents, narcissistic parents, you have such parents who are narcissistic and crazy. We're not talking about that. That's obviously they need a lot of healing and help. We're talking about decent people, people who have sacrificed their lives to be able to bring these children to the world, to raise them, to to give them everything they needed, shelter physically and emotionally and spiritually. And then as they grow up and certain realities emerge and they go down certain pathways, the disappointment, the pain, it's not just I'm a selfish person and I want it to be my way. It's a parent who really wants to see the success of the child, the bliss of the child, the moral and spiritual and physical and financial and ethical and familial and social success of that child. And this is where it could become very, very challenging because here I can easily look at what I need and what I want in order for me to be able to feel spiritually good about myself and project that onto my child rather than really tune into where the child is and how they need me to show up for them at this moment for them to really be able to find their soul. And that requires a lot of uh, unblending, or I should say the opposite of enmeshment. Enmeshment means we're so close that there's also no difference between you and me. And the danger in that is that I'm thinking very much about myself and that becomes you. So the Baruch HaMach and Baruch Hu is that very humbling journey to be able to pause, breathe, sit back, (laughs) relax, enjoy the show. Maybe it's not a show. Enjoy the journey, I should say. Right? And that's what Seder means. The word Seder means order. Why is it called order? I wouldn't say it's the most orderly night in the Jewish calendar. There's a lot that can go wrong <laughs> in the preparations. The reason it's called, in fact, I would say one of the more chaotic nights, there's so much going on, especially if you have a big Seder Baruch Hashem and there's a lot of people and a lot of personalities. The idea of Seder, why is it called Seder Shal Pesach? The idea of Seder is that where things look chaotic, there is really an order. The Seder of Pesach means where sometimes things look like there's no Seder. It's absolutely chaotic. We come a gate, a life, and this one thing is happening, that thing is happening. I'm still waiting to see that, I mean, I haven't been at so many Seders because I have my own Seder, but that perfect Seder table where everything is in order. If you're doing the Seder right, nothing is in order. First of all, somebody spilled the wine on somebody else's matzah. That's the first thing. Before you start, right? So already, Yankees upset at Dvayu. Second of all, somebody hasn't slept for a few nights. So somebody's nerves are literally on the edge. And all we need is just that one trigger. And there's a full, full-fledged explosion. You know, a prelude to a third world war in the house. Everybody's laughing. It sounds like you know what I'm talking about. Okay, good. I'm glad. I'm glad, right? So it's not like a secret in one Seder, right? Right. So many, it's not hidden. <laughs> a lot of people think, you know, why can't I have that perfect Seder, right? Why can't I have the Seder like the other person? <laughs> you know, go to that Seder. But that's exactly the point. I once, a uh, uh, father was once telling me how frustrated he was about a Seder because he bought all these Haggadahs before Pesach and he prepared all this beautiful material. You know, he, I don't know, he bought like all these Haggadahs with insights and stories and inspiration and he was planning, you know, to spew to, to, to express uh, diamonds of gems of wisdom and, and with eloquence and the children would just be mesmerized and enthralled right the worst mistake a father can make before Pesach and he meant it well and then he said nothing nobody was interested in his titus nobody was interested in his drachas I didn't want to tell him you know if I was your kid I also wouldn't be so interested <laughs> I was polite but uh, <laughs> the point is he was very disappointed. It was a letdown. So I told them, you know, it's important to know what the Seder is. The Seder is the Torah gives one mitzvah for the night of Pesach. There's a mit- a, if you ask, what are the biblical mitzvahs for the night of Pesach? What are the mitzvahs of Torah? The answer is to eat matzah. And then there's one more mitzvah. The mitzvah is, We just read it. You should connect to your child. That's the mitzvah. So your expectations of what it's supposed to look like and what it's not supposed to look like, those are self-imposed. What if you can get rid of all your expectations and just tune into a space where you can really and genuinely connect to your child and to each and every child without 
the need for it looking a certain way or having a certain outcome. Just enjoy them. Just connect them. Just celebrate life with them. Just can they feel when you say, wow, Baruch HaMakam, Baruch Hu, Baruch Baruch So we sing the song. It's a nice song. Baruch HaMakam, Baruch Hu. But the experience of that song is much deeper than just the melody. Baruch Am I getting it right? <laughs> By the time I'm holding this, somebody in my family is already holding Dayenu. So, <laughs> you know, there's always somebody holding Dayenu when you're starting Yachatz, right? <laughs> okay, ready for the Afrikaima? Let's go. Get the eggs. Where are the ribs? Where's the steak? <laughs> that ability, can they feel that you're actually thanking Hashem for them? Thank you, Hashem, that you are my son, that you are my daughter, that I have you in my life. That openness to a journey that is deeper than my own ego, my own orbit, my own expectation, is the prerequisite, it's the genesis, to be able to address each child in that unique and powerful way. So now, let's see the actual conversation with these children. So if the first one, and you have it also in your source sheet, again, it's a quote from the Haggadah, the journey begins with the Chacham. The Chacham we call the wise child. <laughs> what does he say? What does that mean? Actually, you have, if you want the English translation, you have it on uh, side two. He says, what are the Edas, the testimonies, the statues and the laws which Hashem has commanded you? Okay, that's a question. You shall instruct them in the laws of Pesach. We don't eat any dessert after the Afi Kaiman. <laughs> Interesting. That's the conversation. Done. So the Chachem, the wise child, says, What are all these Edis, Chukim, Mishpatim? What are they all about, all these laws? Tell him the laws, and then tell him we don't eat anything after the Afi Kaiman. <laughs> What type of conversation is this? We're talking about it with an, an intelligent child, a wise child, so there must be some wise question and some wise answer. It's so brief, it's so concise. What's, this, what's, the, what's his question or her question? What is our response? So some say, tell him the laws of Pesach and go all the way till the end. And what's the last law? The last law is that you can't eat anything after the Avikim because then your meal is over. So then it would seem that this law is just brought in here incidentally. It's not really meaningful which is a little difficult to understand. What does it mean? Ein maftir in achira Pesach afi kaiman? So afi kaiman actually is a combination of two words. Afikuman, bring out the dessert. So ein maftir in achira Pesach afi kaiman, we don't eat any dessert after the Pesach. Once they used to eat the carbon Pesach, the lamb that was offered, after that they didn't eat anything else. Today we don't eat a carbon Pesach, we eat a piece of matzah, which we call the afi kaiman, instead of the carbon Pesach. So after that we don't eat anything else, just like in the times of the base, I mean, they didn't eat anything afterwards. That is what we're telling the Chach. What is the nature of this conversation? So if you take a look in your last source, it's on, the, on side two of the source sheets, you see your last source, Sfas Emes, Tafri Islam Adalat. The teaching from the Sfas Emes, the holy Sfas Emes, who was the third, the second, the grandson of the Chidush Harim. Rabbi Yehuda Aryeh Leib Alter of Ger. So Pesach Tafri Shlam that would be 1874. He has a piece, a beautiful piece. He says, The four children represent the four languages the Torah uses for redemption. There was a redemption from all four exiles that the Jewish people would experience throughout history. They had the Babylonian exile, they had the Greek exile, the Persian exile, the Persian exile, the Greek exile, and then the Roman exile. These four questions exist in every single person, every Jew. Each Jew has these four questions. The four questions of the four children exist in every person. 
The first one is the Chachem. This is the question that comes from Seichel, comes from an intellect, comes from Chachma, comes from wisdom. And he says what the question is. The Yetzirah has questions about the Chukim, the laws of Torah, called Chukim. Here is the answer. Prepare it in your heart. To fulfill Hashem's will has more flavor and joy even than understanding the reason. That's why we don't need anything after the Afikoyman. Because the lingering taste of matzah, which matzah is not very tasteful, it's bland, is more sweet than any other flavor in the world, and that's why you don't want to eat anything afterwards. Here this Fasemis is revealing the very profound conversation that happens between the parent and the first child called the Chacham. This intellectual child, call him the Chacham, he's calling him the intellectual, he's an intellectual citizen. He's thoughtful. He's reflective, he's inquisitive, he's brainy. So the, the Sasema says he doesn't mind and is not perturbed by the rational principles of Yiddishkeit. What he asks is, What perturbs him are the fact that there's different types of laws in Judaism. There's Edus, there's Chukim, and there's Mishpatim. That's why he talks about all three. That there are different types of laws. There are laws that don't make so much sense or don't make sense at all to his or her mind. Very few people, certainly in the Jewish world, have a serious problem, at least intellectually, with all the mitzvahs that we call mishpatim. They're very rational mitzvahs. Nobody has a problem with loy sertzach, don't murder, or loy signoiv, don't steal, right? Or midvar sheketerchak, don't lie, don't deceive, uh, loy sinaf, uh, don't, don't commit adultery. I mean, all these things people understand they're the basis of civilization. Like Hillel said, what you dislike to be done to you, don't do it to anybody else. The golden rule. It's very hard to argue with the dedication of Yiddishkeit to charity, to tzedakah, or to justice, or to education, or to honor the old, the elderly, or to honor your father and mother, or, or not to slander. It's very hard to argue with these things. Every decent person understands the benefit of these types of laws. What's bothering the Chachem, says this Fasemes, is We don't only have Mishpatim, we have Edis and Chukim and Mishpatim. It says, What are all of these mitzvahs that seem very inconsequential and insignificant rationally? Right? Because a boy once said, You're going to tell me that God cares if I dawn black boxes? <laughs> on my left muscle, on my arm, and on my head? Like, you're going to tell me that, that a great God who's infinite really cares if I ate meat and I didn't wait the time that I need to wait in order to eat ice cream or pizza on Mitzvah Shabbos? And you're going to say that V'hinei Hashem nitzav alav u'maloi chalaretz kvoidei u'mabet alav u'voichin kloyiz v'alevi mevde karayu that God really thinks about that and cares about that? It says in Svarim that Ram, it says, we say in Halal, Ram al Kalgayim Hashem. Hashem is exalted above all the nations. So it's interesting that Ram is Reish Mem, 240. It's the same gematria of Amalek. Amalek. Amalek is Ayin, is 70, and Mem is 40, so that's 110. And another Kuf is 210. And Lamed is 30, so it's 240. Amalek is the same letters like Ram. Because one of the, 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 the complaints of Amalek is, Ram, Hashem is too big to be so small. You're going to tell me, right, if I'm with, uh, the, the, I ate Shalom Shabbos afternoon and there was meat in the Shalom and I didn't realize that Chas Shalom, it's too late. I didn't look at the clock when I ate the Shalom, so I didn't realize what a disaster it's going to be from Mitzvah Shabbos pizza party. And then you're going to tell me that Hashem is looking at the, cl <laughs> at the clock if five, only five hours... <laughs> And 30 minutes passed, you have another half an hour to six hours, those who wait six hours. I know there's different men hug him. And that's what, he's care that's what he cares about. Amalek says, you're insulting him. Ram al Hashem. He's bigger, he's exalted. You're talking about an infinite God. Look at the sun that he created, the moon that he created. And you're going to tell me that your half an hour before you eat chalav dairy ice cream is going to be relevant to the big picture. 
This comes from a chacham. Chacham ha'almeim. That's what the Svasama says. What's the idea? How could a rational person say, you're going to tell me that eating crunchy matzah on Pesach that was made a certain way, because if it was waited, waited another few minutes, you're not allowed to eat it. It's an isakaris to eat it. This is really relevant. This is really meaningful. And using a mikveh instead of a bathtub in my house is really, really critical to God's will. What's that all about? You're going to tell me I understand to be nice to a person, I understand. But tell me that eating shrimp or eating bacon or eating lobster, this is considered wrong and destructive. You're going to tell me that Hashem knows the difference. Today you go to a kosher restaurant, they give you fake crab. You see that? They even have on the menu, it's called bacon. I don't know what they put in there because I never tasted bacon. Huh? Fake it. So you're going to tell me that God also looks at the menu, and says, oh, this is real crab, this is fake crab, and he knows the difference. And does he care if I put on a light on Shabbos or I light a fire on Shabbos? So here, he's perturbed by the chukim, like shotness. I can't wear a hat or a garment that mixed wool and linen. Religion should be about ethics, being a good person, being a decent person, being a considerate person, being a generous person. On this comes the answer. We don't eat after the afikaima. <laughs> we don't have dessert after the afikaima means dessert. It's an expression. Afikaima means dessert. Ein maftir in Acher Pesach. After the carbon Pesach, you don't have Afikaim, which is dessert. Today we call Afikaim the dessert because it's the last thing we eat, like dessert. At the end of a meal, you serve dessert, and after dessert, you don't eat anything. Unless in some houses where you start after the dessert. This is the answer. Why do we want the afikaiman should be the last thing in our mouth? We want that the taste of the afikaiman, of the matzah, should linger in our mouth throughout the evening, till you retire. If I eat something else afterwards, whether it's a piece of fish, a piece of meat, or soup, etc., etc., I'm mixing up the flavor. We know that matzah is considered something that's more bland. Even though everybody during the say they say, wow, the matzah this year is delicious. True. But I never saw anybody serve at their daughter's wedding at the Viennese table. The main thing should be matzah. If the caterer says, what do you want, sushi? No, I want matzah. Main course, also matzah. And the reason is, yeah, during Pesach we have no breda. So we say the matzah this year is unbelievable. It's unbelievable. It's delicious. <laughs> it really is. I agree. <laughs> matzah is considered a bland food. But here we say, as he puts it, and the words are beautiful. There's more flavor in the matzah, and I don't want to lose this flavor. I want it to linger in my mouth. That's why I don't eat anything afterwards. He says, The flavor of the mitzvah of matzah, even though it's not something that is considered so tasty and delicious and flavorable, is more delicious than anything else. What is the, what is, what is the answer to the Ben Chacham? The answer to the Ben Chacham is that the most important relationships in life are the relationships that touch a truth that is beyond our rational grasp. And that's what the taste of the mitzvah of matzah represents. And that's why we want it to linger in our mouth and not confuse it with any other taste, because that's considered the most powerful and tasty experience. What's so tasty about the experience? <clears throat> the deepest relationships that we have in life are not al piseichel. They're not logical. What does it mean they're not logical? They're not against logic. You can explain them, but they're not defined or they can't be summed up through logic. These are relationships, if you want to say in Yiddish, nicht mit kenze verstehen, nicht mit darf sie verstehen, nicht mit will sie verstehen. There's relationships, you can't fully understand it, you don't need to fully understand it, and therefore deep down you don't want to fully understand it. To give an example, let's take the relationship between a mother and a child, or a father and a child. This says in Svarim, the reason there's a mitzvah of kibbutz is because the father and the mother, 
did so much for the child. So it's basically a karis satayv. If you do me a favor, I should reciprocate. Since a mother and a father did some favors for a child, <laughs> at least two or three. So therefore it says in Svarim, there's a mitzvah, kabbat a zavich to reciprocate. But if you're going to define that as the relationship, the essence of the relationship between a parent and a child, I did something for you, now do something back for me. We know it's true, but it's really a very skin deep description of it. If somebody is going to say, why does a mother care so much for a child? Or what's the connection between a child and a parent? And we're talking here in a, in a, a relationship that's blossoming, that's flourishing on a conscious level, not only on an unconscious level. It's much more than a mathematical equation because it happens to be that I took care of this child and I asked this child and I fed this child and I gave them a home and I paid for their rent and I also bought them a suit and I bought them clothes and I paid for their tuition and I paid for their therapy. <laughs> and I slept them here and I slept them to the doctor and I made sure there's three meals a day and I did their laundry. So usually when you invest so much in something, yeah, there's a relationship there and there should be a relationship back. The truth is, it's what's called, in Svarim, it's called a Kesher Atzmi. It's an essential relationship. Of course, it's re- it reflects itself. There could be many reasons. But it's an essential relationship that goes beyond one explanation or another explanation. It's not, I love you because you did for me favors. Or I love you because, you know, you're going to say Kaddish for me, so I shouldn't love you. <laughs> I love you because you're continuing my genes. So therefore, it makes sense that you love, evolutionary biologists love to say that the entire relationship between parents and children is, it makes sense, survival of the fittest. Without my child, who's going to continue my genes? So basically, you're continuing my genes. So I love me and I love my genes. So I love you because you're continuing my genes. Okay, there's a truth to that. But you're not talking about something that's a logical, mathematical equation and therefore there is a relationship. The relationship touches a place that's deeper than Seichel. It's deeper than understanding. It's not something that the mind, through its intellectual analysis, could grasp, could define. It's not something that you need to define that way. And it's not something you even want to define that way, because if you define it that way, you're reducing it, you're minimizing it. It's much deeper. It includes that too. It's logical too. But you don't want to reduce it only to that, because it's a much deeper experience than that. This is what you're telling the Ben Chachem. The relationship of a person to the Creator, the relationship of the soul to the Creator is that it's a chelik elekami mal. Chelik elekami mal means, you're like a child. A child who experiences the safety and the unconditional love of a mother and a father, there is a relationship that's much deeper than the analytical intellectual experience. In fact, if you hear a child intellectualizing too much about the relationship with their parent, I can guarantee you that there's a pain over there, there's a wound over there. It's almost like I have to rationalize and justify and explain it because something in my innermost being is not feeling it. There's a lack of safety, which is very common, unfortunately. When there is that conscious connection and safety, it goes beyond seichel. Can I explain it rationally? I can explain it rationally also. But I don't reduce it to a rational analysis. If somebody says to me, are the deepest relationships in your life defined purely by an intellectual uh, mathematical equation, please. I once heard there was a Yid, uh, he was the personal secretary of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, his name was Rabbi Label Groner, Olava Shalom. So he was dating his wife, Tzalanga Yarn, her name is Rebbe Tzin Yehudas Groner. It was 1954. And they were dating, and then it was time, I guess, to decide one way or another way. So he was working for the Rebbe, so he thought, what better option, right? So he asked the Lubavitcher Rebbe, should he... uh, (laughs) Should he, uh, you know, should he propose? Should he complete the shidduch? <laughs> he was already working for the Rebbe for five years. This is the early 50s. So he said the Rebbe looked at him and said, the mirakasha, you're asking me a question. Nish dein tate ken de entfinen. Nish dein mama ken de entfinen. Nish ich ken de entfinen. Nish dein kop ken de entfinen. Dein heart stuff de entfinen. You're asking a question, your, your father can't answer it for you, your mother can't answer it for you, I can't answer it for you, and even your brain alone can't answer it for you. You have to consult your heart. And he pointed to the heart. What does that mean? You shouldn't talk to your father and mother about your shidduch, you should. You shouldn't talk to your brain about your shidduch, you should. You should talk a lot to your brain about your shidduch. But it means there's something that goes beyond that. It's not just you have to take, make me make a list and as they tell you, do the pros and do the cons. <laughs> Hopefully there's more pros than cons about the bachetel. 
and it has to make sense. If it doesn't make sense, even if your heart is all over the place, you have to be very, very careful because we all know that our hearts can be chaotic and our hearts can sometimes deceive us. But if a person is only like a computer, you know, ask artificial intelligence, right? Put into artificial, should I marry, <laughs> should my daughter marry this boy? Be careful. Artificial intelligence is very, very, very brilliant. But in terms of a heart, I don't know. <laughs> they may pick up information about hearts. There's something about the heart where there is complete surrender, complete trust. There's nothing that replaces that. It's not that we don't like the intellect and we don't use, we have to use the intellect, but it can only bring you to a certain place. There's something in the texture of connection, of intimacy, of oneness that transcends an intellectual experience of life. And that's why it's the most important part. When a child is born, what's the most important part for the child? The safety, the connection, the sense of unconditional love. This is a safe world for you. This is a safe home. This is a safe place. That allows, actually, the brain to develop, to open up, to be inquisitive, rather than the amygdala controlling everything because there's a sounding alarm that there's danger in this place. So it actually allows the brain to understand much more. But what allows it is... Because they could be emotional. There's a safety emotional. When that's missing, no intellect in the world can replace it. No intellect in the world. When somebody is missing, that's, that's love, that trust, that connection. Words won't do it. There are situations sometimes where there's a home where there's no trust, where there's no safety. But words can be used to substitute it. But those words will never compensate for real safety. And the soul knows it. The soul knows if there's real attachment or not. The same is true in all aspects of our life and it begins in our relationship with ourselves and therefore our relationship with Hashem. When you understand that's the nature of the relationship, it's not about intellect. On the contrary, I'll touch much more truth when I don't understand. Why? Because when I understand everything, it's basically a relationship that's very much on my terms. It's a relationship with my own little ego. A real relationship is a relationship on the other person's terms as well. There is intimacy. There is true connection. And that's why the true relationship between a person and Hashem is not a relationship that's reduced to intellect. This is a mitzvah that I understand and therefore I celebrate it. It's rather a relationship that transcends the intellect. It's a relationship nicht to kenes verstehen, nicht to verstehen, nicht to willes verstehen. It's a relationship not I could understand it, because even a soul is infinite, and the source of the soul is for sure infinite. How are you going to understand infinity? How are you going to understand it? Understanding infinity by definition makes it not infinite. I also don't have to understand it. What do I have to understand it for? Why do I, I don't have to understand it. It doesn't take away from the relationship if I don't understand it. And I don't even want to understand it. You know why? Because wanting to understand it means I want to control it. I want to turn it into something that's brainy. I want to turn it, I don't want to do that. I don't want to minimize it. I don't want to reduce it. I don't want to understand. It. So first of all, I can't. Second of all, I don't need it. <laughs> Third of all, I don't want. In those situations that I need to use my intellect to figure things out that my brain can figure out. Pajalas to gesund to hate. Well, once you touch a deeper fabric of the relationship... It's much deeper than that. It's more authentic than that. It's more powerful than that. It shouldn't be reduced to that. So that's what you're telling the Chacham. If you want to reach the ultimate Chacham, you don't need dessert. You don't want dessert after that. Ah, you'll say, this is dessert. Bring me some chocolate seven layer cake. Bring some ice cream as dessert. There's no greater flavor. There's no greater tam than the flavor of complete surrender than the flavor of complete bittal, the flavor of complete submission. Obviously, if I'm in a danger zone, surrender is dangerous. Then you have to use your brain and you have to be in control. But when you have a real relationship, a relationship that's filled with safety and connection, what's greater than surrender? I'm asking you a question. If there's somebody you really love and somebody you really trust, not at 90%, not 90%, 100%, and you know that they really love you and they really trust you, and it's a relationship that's unconditional, What's a greater flavor than the flavor of surrender? Than the flavor that I can let go of everything and fall in to the arms, to the embrace of the divine beyond my seichel. That's why usually they says in Svarim that we should do chukim with the same geshmak like we do mishpatim. 
But really, it's the opposite. We should do mishpatim with the same gishmak that we do chukim. In chukim, there's a good, so I don't understand. Even better, <laughs> you don't understand. Adarab, much better. So now I don't have to reduce it to my equation. Now I can actually connect to the other fully, fully. Even mishpatim, I should be able to do with the same gishmak, with the same depth, like chukim. So this is where the person understands that the real nature of Yiddishkeit is a relationship. It's a visceral, emotional relationship. It includes the brain too. Learning is a major part of it. But it's not defined and reduced to an intellectual coldness, which really still represents that I'm in my box and you're in your box, and we're just understanding each other. That's why the Rebbe told him, you can't, you're going to choose your wife, you're going to choose your kala, because the brain says it makes sense to be with this person. So th- that's how deep the marriage is going to be. You know, we'll both be with our brains. And when a husband and wife both live in their brains, there's just, they may be very good people, but there's something that's just, it's not connecting. It may be words, but there's something internal that's not connecting. If a father and a child only connect with their brains, there's something off. You could, am I making sense? Should I stop talking? <laughs> I'm talking about something really that words uh, don't really capture it because words are, you know, brainy a little bit. <laughs> now we come to the second child. The second child is called the Russia. Now, usually when we hear the word Russia, you know, it's evil, uh, bad, wicked. In most English, our God, this is wicked. And that's why most people can't relate to it. Because, hey, you're not going to look at your child and say he's a wicked kid. Like, I'm still looking for that wicked child. Very hard to find that wicked child. <laughs> the truth is, as it's talking about a pain that this person is experiencing. There's a rebelliousness. Let's, talk, let's look at the second paragraph. Russia Ma Weimer. It's your first page. Russia Ma Weimer. The third to the last paragraph. Russia Ma Weimer. Ma Avoida Zeis Lechem Lechem Veloiloi. What's this thing that you're doing? What's this Avoida that you're doing? Lechem Veloiloi. He says to you, not to him. What are you doing? It's to him, to, to you, not to him. Ulafisha Itzi Atzmim and Aklal Kafa Biker Vafata Hakke is Shinav and Merle Bavurza Asa Shem Libetesim and Slam. Leave Veloiloi Ilo Hayasham Loyenigal. Basically, <laughs> by excluding himself from the community, he has denied that which is fundamental. He was kaifa be'ikir. He denies the basics of everything. He excluded himself. Therefore, blunt his teeth and say, it's because of this that, I, it's because of this that Hashem did this for me when I left Egypt. For me, not for him. If he had been there, he wouldn't have been redeemed. At the surface, it's a very, very negative response. And when was the last time when somebody asked you a question you didn't like, the advice should be blunt his teeth. Yeah. You know, take a hammer, you know, get rid of the teeth. How is that going to help? And telling him, you know, you wouldn't have been redeemed. What, what, what's the nature of the conversation here? What's going on here? So if you take a look again in the Svasemes, the Svasemes, that's the last source, one, two, three, four... Four lines, the last word. Vaharasha Pirik El Mamish, Maha Vaida, Va Imra Lachem, Pirush, Ma Kaikh Shal Basavadam Lavid Hashem is Barak. Vaidaza Mahar Akharash Gokhel Yoina, Va Chuva, Bavur Ze Pirush, Aidesho Basavadam, the Ainla Sechel Kuroi, Khashuv Lafanov is Barak of the Sena Yosem and Malachi Elian. He's saying something very, very profound. When the Russia says, this child says, Ma Avoida Zeslechem. He's saying it's not really talking about someone who's evil or wicked or rebellious. But rather, there's an element here, you could make, call it that it's maybe a tinge of, of depression or sadness or melancholy. But for this, we have to dig much deeper into the words. When he says, what's this whole thing that's going on here? Being in a relationship. There is an internal pain that sits in this Russia. It's hard for him to believe that he or she has a beauty, a grace, to the extent that Hashem wants to connect with him. That's what he says here, you see? 
To assume that our lives have real meaning beyond, beyond our biased selves is something that is very difficult for him to understand. In other words, the Russia comes to a conclusion that life really is meaningless. It's very hard to believe that, say, my life with all the challenges in the world, with a world that sometimes looks like a jungle, with a world that seems chaotic. The Russia is also not a stupid kid. The Russia hears the news, he watches the news. He sees the toy of Avayu, and more than anything, he feels the pain. And we live in a world with a lot of pain, I don't have to tell you. Internally, people experience so much pain, and you see not just in yourself, but people around you, and in the entire world. And the Russia says, obviously, this whole thing is just a random game. Either there's no God, and if there's a God, he's certainly removed and detached. Because, and this you'll often hear from people, who will say, for me to believe that God is involved in the universe brings me to a conclusion that he must be either careless, chas v'shalom, or cruel, or sadistic, or so enjoy suffering. It's hard, there's so much pain. And to say that somehow he cares about my life, and intimately about my life. As the Mishnah says, The world was created for me. Come on. So it's easier for the Russia to say, you know, you know, Stop taking these things too seriously. It doesn't really make sense. Everyone is on their own. You're a random mistake. You're an infinitesimal blimp on the surface of infinity. Just a little particle of dust that began by mistake and will end by mistake. And just like the solar eclipse happens, you know, everybody is eclipsed one day. So there's really an in internal sense of pain that leads to an internal sense of worthlessness. In the ultimate scheme of things, do I really matter? Does my life matter? Do my behaviors matter? Do my thoughts, words, and actions matter? It's not such a superficial question. It's a deep question. As he puts it, a speck, of, a speck of dust in an endless, ever-expansive universe. How seriously can you take that speck of dust? Sometimes a person can wake up in the morning, you know, passionate about life. Sometimes a person wakes up, you know, nothing really matters. Everything is garnished, but garnished, and whatever I do, it anyway doesn't make a difference. And then you see some depressing piece of news, and it plunges you further into despair. So you want me to celebrate a Pesach and a Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, something that's meaningless. And as the Fasemis puts it, everyone has these questions inside of themselves. It's not four children outside of us. It's four children inside of us. And that's the key to understand this. When we talk about four children, it's not four children sitting around the table, it's four children inside my own heart. And I think it's one of the most powerful insights I've seen about the four children that he brings out here. It's four children, everyone has an inner child. There's a part of me that's still three years old, if you haven't noticed. It sometimes comes out in the classes. There's a part of me that's nine years old. There's a part of me, yeah, I make believe as an adult. We all have these four children in our hearts. The only way we could celebrate the four children around the table is if we could celebrate and make space for the four children inside of us. If I can talk to all the four kids inside of me, then I can talk to all the four kids out around my table. If I can't, then I don't know how to talk to these kids. And that's why you'll see when people get very triggered by their children, and people do, we all do, the most important thing is, can you find that child inside yourself? And talk to it first before you talk to the actual child. Try it to see how powerful it is. Whatever that child is triggering inside of you exists inside of me. There's that voice inside of me. I'm responding to something. If somebody just asks me a question, even if it's a very intense question, and I have nothing of it inside of me, I could just listen and respond. The moment you say something to me and I'm rattled, it's because you woke up something inside of me that was dormant. That's a fact. And it includes even your own children. My child speaks to me about something that's not inside of me. I can be there for them. I can be curious, inquisitive, loving. But when they're telling me something about me, even if it's not about me, it's about them. But it's waking up something in me. I'm like, oh my God, I really have to silence this because I'm silencing the part of me. So the one I have to speak to first is the child in myself. Can you have a conversation about this with the child inside of you that's asking these questions or dealing with these issues or confronting you in this way? 
And then if you could make space for that child inside yourself, you'll be able to automatically make space for the child outside of yourself. So as we see here, both the Chacham and the Rasha, they're inside of me. What do we now tell this child? And again, it's the child I'm talking to inside of me. And the answer is very moving. What we tell this Rasha is, as the Haggadah puts it, what do we answer to the Rasha? And we say, What does it mean? Because of this, Hashem took me out of Egypt. What's the Bavurza? Because of your question. Your question itself is your answer. How is your question an answer? Because you're an imperfect being. Bavurza, because. We are finite in the presence of infinity and so small in comparison to infinity because we're easily tempted, because we're frail, because we're mortal, because we have to deal with darkness, because we're so easily distracted. That's exactly why Hashem chose to forge a relationship with each and every one of us. In other words, the basis of the question is the answer itself. The Russia is saying, a big God is interested in big things. Infinity is interested in infinity. But that existed pre-creation. Pre-creation you had infinity and only infinity. What's the whole Chiddush? What's the whole uftu? What's the whole accomplishment of creation? As the Medrash says, Nisava Kadesh Baruch Hu liyas loy Hashem wanted to have a home in the lowest element of reality. In other words, the only unique, what happens as a result of creation? Everything was there pre-creation. Hashem was there, all his light, infinity, presence. So if the whole purpose of creation was just more light, you had that much better before creation. The whole Kiddush of creation was transforming darkness into light. That didn't happen pre-creation. In fact, that can't happen through God because God is infinite light. Where and how does it happen? It happens through the human interaction with darkness. And heaven knows that every one of us interacts with darkness. And when you take your little piece of darkness or big piece of darkness and I work it through and I reveal divine oneness in that place, that's called making a dira betachtayna. It's creating a home for infinity in the lowest place of reality. In other words, the stuff from which we create Hashem's home is not heavenly, it's earthly. The stuff from which we create the ultimate world of redemption is the stuff of darkness, the stuff of struggle. It's my inner thoughts and words and actions and my inner space and the world around me that I'm responsible for, that I'm connected to. You're saying, I'm frail, I'm small, I'm insignificant, I'm a weak person. There's so much confusion and darkness in the world. That's the world I was brought into. That world is the purpose. It's not a mistake. It's not some random error. It's precisely the purpose. And then he says, Hakeyashinov, bluntest teeth. What's that going to help? It's interesting. If you take a look at the word Shinov, if you take a look at the word Shinov, it's spelled Shin Nun Yudvav. Shin Nun Yudvav is 366. Shin is 300, Nun and Yud is 60, Vav is 6, 366. Take the Hebrew word for Russia, Reish, Shin, Ayin, it's 570. So we're talking about a Russia. If you blunt the teeth of the Russia, what does it mean you blunt the teeth of the Russia? If you remove his teeth, so you take the number 570 and you remove from it Shin Nun Vav 356. So who's good at math? What's 570 minus 366? Russia is 570. Reish Shin Ayin. Shinov is 366. Shin Nun Yud Vav. So if you take 570 and we remove Shinov, so you end up with 206 which is tzaddik. Very good. Very good. What's the point? Afatak is shinov means the bite. <laughs> the bark, as they say, is bigger than the bite. What does this mean? 
the powerful message that God is saying is that what I need here is ahake is shinov. This person is a tzaddik, but there's teeth that are blocking it. Hakei as Shinov means a person needs to be able to find their own worth, their own value, their own power. That's what we need. He needs to stop biting into himself and seeing himself as valueless, as meaningless, as small. Realizing how much God loves him. He wants you. You're small exactly. <laughs> You're struggling. That's exactly why he wants you. So Shinov is, I could look at the bite and get very, very disappointed and get very afraid. Hakeya Shinov means, can you blunt the bite? Can you go deeper than the bite? And then you'll see there's an innocent sadik behind the rush. And you always see it. I was in Israel for a while. So I went to visit somebody's. A father, a bereaved father, who lost his child uh, in the horror since October 7th. And a very, very, you know, secular Jew. And he tells me, I'm not going to shul anymore. And uh, he's very, very upset and very upset at everybody, at everybody. And a lot, a lot of pain. And a lot of anger towards, you know, towards God and towards religion and towards Judaism and towards Jews. It's also a very sad story there. But in any case, I was just listening. I was just listening, listening, listening empathizing, hugging, just listening to the story in detail. As the conversation went on, it was so fascinating. This person, I'm not going to shul anymore. I have issues. I don't like this whole thing. It was very upset. Like maybe, I don't know, maybe an hour later or 45 minutes later, I was just standing there and listening, really trying to tune into this person. He starts bra bragging to me about what family he comes from. So what is he bragging? That his Zayda was a billionaire? No. That he comes from a family that for, for generations they were clay kaidish. For generations they served spiritually their communities. And not only that, they have a tradition in the family that they go back to the time of the Beis Hamikdash and that they had a certain avoid, they did a certain job for the Jewish people during the time of the second Beis Hamikdash. And he's bragging about it. <laughs> And he's so excited about it. And then he tells me, and this son who was killed, this son of his, completely secular. He says, before Yom Kippur, before the last Yom Kippur, he comes to him and he says, Father, teach me Birchas Kayanim, because they're Kayanim. You, what do you have with Birchas Kayanim? Teach it to me. He says, why? He says, I'm coming to Shul Yom Kippur. You coming to Shul Yom Kippur? He didn't come to Shul He says, I'm coming. And he says, he came and he did Berchus Kayan and we blessed the community. And he was bragging about it. And I'm thinking, I didn't say, I'm thinking to myself, I said, an hour ago, you're telling me. <laughs> it was so interesting, it was so fascinating. And then I realized, that's what happens. There's, we have different layers and those layers are all part of who we are. So you look at the bite, the shinayim, you have these teeth. Oh, they're biting, I'm scared. And I start biting back. He says, no, no. Don't react to teeth with teeth. React to teeth to hear what's behind the teeth. There's something deeper than the Shinov. Shinov is 350, 366. Take away the Shinov from Russia and you have 206, Tzaddik. And that's why we say Baruch HaMakayim and then Baruch Hu. Baruch HaMakayim is the space. Hashem is manifested in this space. Who, in Hebrew, is second person, a third person, right? Who is he? Or in, in the feminine, it's he, she. If you have a Polish or Yiddish, it's confusing. But in, uh, in, in, in the accent, you have who and you have he. Who is he? If somebody is in front of me, I don't say he. I say you. If somebody is in front of me, I don't say she. She went because she's not here. It's third person. Baruch HaMakim Baruch Hu. Baruch Hu means you're also thanking Hashem. Where is Hashem Hu? It may be concealed, but it's concealed. Don't think it's gone. That's why it's Hu. Makim is it's manifested in the Ben Chacham. The Ben Chacham is looking for a relationship. He's trying to understand what type of relationship. Why do I need Chukim? 
The Rush is saying, what relationship? There's no relationship. This world is a crazy place. So you have to go beyond the Shanaim. You have to say, Bavurza, the sense of pain that you're having, the sense of darkness that you're having is not the reason to despair. It's the reason to understand what your mission is. It's transforming darkness into light. Don't let your darkness cause you to despair. This is the arena in which we were created to transform darkness into light. That's why it's interesting in Judaism, right? Night always comes before day. The beginning of a day is always the night before. Other cultures, it's not like that. For example, by us in America, middle of the night starts the new day, which makes sense. The first half of the night belongs to yesterday. The second half of the night belongs to tomorrow. Or in other cultures, which makes a lot of sense in the East, you have day begins with sunrise, which makes sense. Till sunrise is the previous day. Sunrise begins a new day. You wake up in the morning. That's when you have a new day. You know, we start our day when we go to sleep. Come on. It's not the way you're supposed to do it. <laughs> You start your day when you wake up. That's when you start your day, or at least a few hours before. The pshat is that in Yiddishkeit, everything is It teaches us that the beginning is the darkness, which our job is to transform into sunlight. Darkness is not a destination. Our world, the darkness in our world, our world is like a factory. <laughs> What's a factory produces? A factory, you put in one thing and something comes out from the other side. In our world, there's a world where there's darkness, with there's struggle. Vayi erev, and then vayi voike yoy mechad. But for this, I have to be able to go beyond the teeth of the Russia and see the pain. And then you'll see the tzaddik. And then you'll understand that I have to be able to validate, and it's always inside myself, and realize that this struggle is where my work is. I don't have to be afraid of it. That's what it's pshat. That's the idea of, that's the idea of dira bitachtoinim. Reb Tzaddik HaKoyen Melablin says, that's what we tell the Russia, leave a loy loy ilu haya sham loy haya nigal. If you would have been there, you wouldn't have been redeemed. And he says something very powerful. He says, over there, before Matan Tereda, by Yitzhiya Mitzrayim, if you would have opted out, you wouldn't have been redeemed. Everybody had to choose. Those who didn't want to leave, didn't have to leave. Ilu haya sham loy haya nigal. But now, after Matan Tereda, of course you'll be redeemed. In other words, your relationship is essential. It's unconditional. And now let's conclude here briefly the last two points. You have the Tam. Tam is sometimes translated as innocent or wholesome or complete. So this Fasemis says, what's the Tam saying? The Tam says, he says, Shailas HaTam Ayidei HaTmimus Ksha Kodesh Baruch Hu Noisen Eza Ara Bechaz Dei Ba Adam Lidei Yisnasus Ba Amrei Mazois V'tzorich Leida Shurak Bechesed Elyon V'zeh HaTshuva Bechoizek Yod Bli Zachi Yisa Adam He says, here you have the exact opposite. You have a rebel or you have a cynic who thinks he's worthless and the whole world is worthless and it's just a meaningless jungle. And certainly Hashem doesn't care about me or about my daily actions. The tam, he says, comes from the word tam, like tmimus, complete. This is a person who feels that all human success is predicated on human action alone. We control our destiny, so why should I serve God? Mazois, he says. What's this? See how well I'm doing. I'm a success story. Why mix God into this? Just teach people to be responsible and to work hard and to put in a full day work and to be creative and to be resourceful and to be powerful and to be courageous and to be fearless and to be able to be bold. And you'll have, be able to succeed. We'll be fine without him. The mindset doesn't say, I'm small, I'm valueless, I'm worthless. That's the Russia. Interesting. The Tam says, no, I'm everything. I don't need anything above me. I'm the master of my own life. When I work hard, I succeed. My success is a credit to me. Like somebody once said about somebody, he's a self-made man and he worships his creator. So this is the third question. You know, maybe in the past, when people didn't understand science, and they were superstitious, they needed... A teenager came to me and he said he's an atheist. I'm from here for Muncie. So I say, what made you an atheist? So he says, listen, it used to be that people like you existed in the world because we didn't know science. So when there's a solar eclipse, so you think the dragon is eating the moon and somebody, uh, the dragon is eating the sun and somebody poisoned the sun and the sun is having a depression and one god is killing another god. So this, but now we know it's pure astronomy 
And therefore, who needs anything else? Mazois, who needs anything else? We have it figured out. We know enough about science, about biology. You don't have to mix God into the picture. You don't have to mix something supernatural into the picture. Everything makes sense, and therefore, we're complete on our own. Mazois, you don't need anything else. <laughs> so I told this boy, <laughs> I said, I'll be honest with you, it's the opposite. If you learn science today and biology today, it is so unbelievable to see every detail, how designed it is and how perfect it is, that to be able to say that it happened by mistake, you need a lot of faith. And I don't have enough faith like you to be able to say that I'm an atheist. Maybe if I would have, I told him, maybe if I had more amuna, I would have had blind faith, I could shut my eyes and say everything has just happened by, on its own. I say, study it, study a cell. They used to think a cell was a simple thing. Today you know that the infrastructure of one cell is more complex than the infrastructure of London and Paris and Tel Aviv and Moscow and New York and Los Angeles and Melbourne put together. And that infrastructure couldn't happen randomly. And one cell has more complex infrastructure and you have 70 trillion of those in one body of one person. Not, not, not even two bodies. <laughs> so I said, listen, you want to have blind? I don't have so much faith. What should I tell you? I have to use my logic a little bit. Here the brain is a blessing. So the Tom says, Mazois. That's what he says. You have to say, With a strong head, Hashem took us out of Egypt. In other words, on our own, we wouldn't be able to lift a finger. All liberation, all emancipation, all life happens only because we're channels from a source that is infinite. Yesh balabayis libirizu. That doesn't stifle a person's creativity, it enhances a person's creativity. When I realize, when I think it's all me and me and me and me, then I take full responsibility. Everything is personal. Everything I have to blame on myself. And then when I face adversity, I fall apart very easily. When I realize I didn't create myself. <laughs> I also didn't create the mess. <laughs> like I said before. I'm a channel. And I'm a humble channel. And I want to be a channel. Then I can tune into the source of life. Then I can be a channel. And then the person can actually be much more creative. So, everybody has a Mitzrayim. Everybody is in exile. The only way I can go out of my Mitzrayim is I'm going to rely on my ego. Say, my ego, my brain, my resources, my looks, my talents, my success. A person should use their talents and should utilize their, success, their, their resources and needs to maximize their potentials and their abilities. But ultimately, I want to know, it's all grace. It's all grace. In other words, the greatest success of a human being is when a person realizes that I'm a channel for Hashem, who created me and creates me every single moment and allows me to show up the way I could show up with the being that He created, that Hashem created. And I can be a channel for that. Then the human being retains perspective. Then the human being retains humility. Then the human being knows who they are and who they're not. Then the human being doesn't get enmeshed in everything. Then I don't have to take responsibility for that which I can't take responsibility. Then I can just show up to be the person I'm supposed to be. When I replace God in life, life becomes very painful. <laughs> and we do it all the time. People in their own mind, inadvertently, we suddenly become God. I have to control, I can't control my life, I can't control my kids, I can't even control my life, I can't even control my digestive system for heaven's sake. If I eat something or drink something, I say, you know what, I like to control things, I'm going to control how my body digests it, really, what exactly are you going to do? <laughs> we know that, but suddenly I could control my spouse and my kids and life and reality and destiny, relax. You don't have to control anything. <laughs> you have to show up the way you could show up to the moment with love, with authenticity, with responsibility as a channel. And then the person is not obsessed with perfectionism or with insecurity. When I'm obsessed with perfectionism, it's a form of playing God. Because if it's not perfect, it's going to be horrible. And what are you going to think about me? And the opposite is insecurity. Who am I? I'm a nobody. It's the two flips, it's two sides. It's the ego that becomes too big or too small. Because the problem is it's trying to replace what it really is. Ego easing God out. If I'm a channel, I'm not perfect and I'm not insecure. 
I'm a channel for Hashem, so I have the most security in the world because I'm His channel. I'm His shliach. And I could show up the way I show up today with the tools that He gave me today. I'm also not afraid of vulnerability and authenticity. I'm afraid of vulnerability and authenticity when I have to play God. What are you going to think of me? If I'm honest with you, what's going to happen? What impression am I going to make on you? I'm busy playing God. If I know who I am, I can be humble, I can be vulnerable, and I can be authentic. And that's the most powerful way a person can be because you're a channel. And when you're a channel, you manifest something that's true. So it doesn't take away from my vulnerability and authenticity. And then he has the last one. She'eni Yedei Elisha, the last child. This son, this child, doesn't think everything needs to be rational like the wise child. Doesn't think that life is meaningless and then God doesn't treasure his or her actions or life like the second child. Doesn't think that all of success comes from his own talents and forgets about Hashem, which is the simplicity of the Tam or the completion of the Tam in his own mind. No, the Sheini Yedei Elishla, somebody doesn't know how to ask. What does that mean? Somebody says, look, I get it, I'm here, I showed up, but I have to tell you, Eino Yedei Elisha, doesn't know how to ask. The word Yedeya in Tanakh means connection. Adam Yodes Chava, Adam knew Chava means Adam had a relationship with Chava. Sheini Yedei Elisha means... I'm not connected to ask. I don't care about asking. I'm not moved enough to ask questions. You know, someone who's asking questions, I'm bothered by something. You're triggering me. It means there's something happening inside. I'm not even bothered to ask. I'll come. You want me to come, I'll come. But my heart is not here. And in many ways, I would say this is such a common thing, and I see it all the time, people. And this is not only children, many, many adults, and even older people who go through it. They they do everything right. But their heart is not there. The heart is completely not there. They checked out years ago. They made a rational calculation. It doesn't make sense to leave physically. So physically I'm here. I may, you know, walk the walk, talk the talk, (laughs) and maybe even walk the walk in the sense of just walking to the right places and dressing in the right attire that fits into this culture and community. But I don't care enough to ask. I am so like, I, I shut down so many years ago. I'm not even perturbed. I'm not even angry at you. I'm not resentful. I just checked out. I'm not moved. My heart is not here. I'm not interested. I'm not interested. It's just boring ritual. I'm not arguing with you. In a way, it's an indifference that is worse than anything else. Because indifference means you're not even triggering me negatively. I am so detached that I'm just detached. And you have it also psychologically in people. Right? Sometimes when we have a relationship with somebody that is intense, it could be positive and it could be negative. But sometimes, you know, you just lift up both hands and it just shut down. You know, they call it freeze, a freeze response or a shutting down response where the person just can't show up anymore. Now, really, it's not so simple. It's also a form of pain because every heart is moved. A heart is alive. And every soul is alive. There's no such a thing you don't care. It doesn't exist. When somebody says, I don't care, it's a cover-up for pain. I couldn't care at some point because the result would have been too much pain. The person who says, I really, really don't care, it's a protective gear. If I don't care, you can't disappoint me. If my heart is not on fire, you won't extinguish it again. If I have a stone right here protecting me, if I checked out, if I'm shut down, if I'm frozen, nothing is going to happen. Right? What do they say? A rock feels no pain and an a rock feels no pain and an island never cries. <laughs> if I'm an island, I won't cry, and if I'm a rock, I won't feel any pain. So it looks like I'm a rock. But really, there's a deep, deep fear, a deep pain, a deep, a deep shutting down. It's cam of camouflage. It's a person. I don't have questions. You want? You want? You want me to eat the mouth? I'll eat. Will snish, nish. I'll get. I'm fine. I respect you. Respect me. Main thing is we shouldn't connect. We shouldn't have a relationship. Sometimes you have marriages like that. You have marriages where there's a lot of fighting. I'm not saying it's good, 
but at least everyone knows what the other person is feeling. <laughs> this person is triggered. That person is triggered. It's a Sometimes you have marriages. There's no fighting at all, but there's no connection. He's not confrontational. She's not confrontational. They live in different planets and different universes. There's no screaming, but there's no connection. There's no relationship. There's nothing happening. That's like the Shani Yadeh Elisha. That's what the Sfasama says. Shani Yadeh Elisha who begolos hamar. The Shani Yadeh Elisha is a victim of a bitter exile. Interesting. Shani Yadeh Eklal Eich Liftoya Chalev. He doesn't even know how to open the heart. I'm not, I'm not bothered by anything. I don't care. I simply don't care. It's a cynicism that's beyond cynicism. I don't even feel the pain. If I would feel the pain, I would care. I don't feel to feel. Because if I felt the pain, that would be painful. I don't want to feel. So I say, I don't have have any questions. Yeah, this is culture. It's fine. Yeah, do whatever you want. I'm not going to be in a fight with you either. I don't have to be in a fight with you. You're not even here for me to be in a fight with you. It's just all superficial. So it's not a question of theology or philosophy. It's basically, I don't care. I don't have any emotions towards any of this. So what does that God say? At psachloi. Interesting advice. What does at psachloi? You open up the heart. What does this mean? It means don't doubt that there's something inside over there. The worst thing I can do is, you shut down, I'll also shut down. Don't shut down. At psachloi. There's a big blockage. Okay? And again, the only way I could talk to that person is if I talk to me. <laughs> if I'm talking to you without talking to me, you're going to trigger me so badly, I'm going to get angry. Now my heart is going to close down. I have to first find each one of these personalities inside of me. I have to have the conversation with the part of me that closes down. And this is such powerful advice. Always talk to that person inside yourself before you start having a conversation with them. So at psachloi means there's no person who's really careless or really uninspired. It doesn't exist. I need to find a way to open the heart. Maybe I haven't had the right words. Maybe I'm not present enough. Maybe my heart is closed down and I am really seeing me <laughs> in a different version. Maybe that's happening. I just, I'm used to it. And here we come back to the Afikaimah. You know, sometimes, and I know this is sensitive and it's not a generalization, but sometimes there are parents who are religious Jews and they do everything right and they do it beautifully, but it's by rote. They're accustomed to it. It's their comfort zone. It's their tradition. It's their culture. Their children are looking for something deeper. And when they're telling their father, I I don't care, there's a message. Tati, do you really care? Or this just works for you. You know, you're 55 years old. You're a respected person in the community. It all works well for you. And you want to make it continue, so you should look good. Do you really, really care? Are you alive? Are you a free person? Does Judaism ignite your fire? Is there a fire in your belly? And we all know the answer sometimes is, Son, thank you for giving me my Afikaima. Maybe I have to open my heart. Because Kamayim upon him, upon him, Kain Leiv Adam Al Adam, At Psachloi. How do I open up somebody else's heart? I can't. I open up my heart. But when I open my heart and there's a flow, hearts are mirrors. If I show you a closed heart, you'll show me back a closed heart. If I show you an open heart, you know what's going to happen? You may start showing me an open heart. Of course, I can't control another person. But at psach Not only open him, open up your heart to loy to that person. This is my work. It's not your work. It's my work. It's really making Hashem alive for me. Pesach alive for me. Judaism alive for me. And everybody knows this is internal stuff. This is not external. It's not what I say. It's not what I do. It's not what I shout. It's not what anybody knows. It's inside of me. Am I alive? Is my heart open? Is my soul vibrant? I'm going to conclude with a story. Say there. You may have heard the story. It's a really, really, really beautiful story. It's a story about the Blazhevi Rebbe. The Blazhevi Rebbe's name was Rabbi Yisrael Spiro. He was born in 1889, and he passed away in 1989. 1889 till 1989. 
He was 199 years old, I think, when he passed away, or 100. His wife and children, the Bloch of Rebbe's wife and children, Rabbi Yisrael Spiro, were murdered in the Holocaust. And he had been interred in the labor camps. And at some point, he was shipped to Bergen-Belsen. As you know, Bergen-Belsen was a camp in Germany. Pesach approached, and it's unbelievable, but the Jews in Bergen-Belsen were talking about how do we obtain matzah for Pesach. There was very little hope, because... Uh, <laughs> How exactly are you going to bake matzah? Are we going to find a matzah bakery in Bergen-Belsen under the tyranny of the SS Yemach Shemam Zichram to be able to bake matzah? But a few Jews decided to go to the Blaj of Rebbe. Maybe together they can come up with some sort of, sort of strategy. The Blaj of Rebbe, like many Wunder Rabbiners they were called, you know, super rabbis, Rebbes, were hated by the Nazis. But there was one German commander in Bergen-Belsen that he had this curiosity about the Blaj of Rebbe. There was just something curious that triggered him. And from time to time, he would go over and engage with him in conversation. He, he appreciated him. This Nazi, he was a commander, and he would talk to him. Obviously, you know, he would make him know who's in charge strike him or beat him but he had this curiosity about him so the blood of Rebbe decided to take a chance he knew he could be punished he could be killed he could be shot but he decided to take a chance a big chance and the next conversation that uh, this commandant had with him in Bergen-Belsen after a few minutes he spoke to him he started to speak to him about Pesach <laughs> And he said that, uh, you know, we celebrate the exodus of Egypt and we have this matzah and he explains to him what matzah is, you know, bread baked in a particular fashion. Maybe Herr Commandant could do something to allow me to get even a little bit of amount of flour and water and we could find an oven and just bake it. The commandant, the Nazi commandant heard this and he couldn't believe the request. Like, you know, where do you think you are, you know? He stared at the blood of a Rebbe for a long time. And the blood of a Rebbe thought, you know, he crossed the border that he shouldn't cross and he didn't know what the consequence will be. And the Nazi just started to walk away and he thought, who knows what the punishment will be just for the request. But as he walked away, a few seconds later, the blood of a Rebbe afraid, he said, I th I'm going to see what I can do for you. He was quite shocked. He didn't repeat the story to anybody else. But a week later, it was a few days before Pesach, this Nazi commander called for the Blaj of Rebbe. He was instructed to send two men to a certain gate and to carry a package to the bunker. The commandant got a small oven <laughs> and he got a few, some flour and water. And he told the Blaj of Rebbe he and a few Jews could bake their matzah. It was like a, a miracle. So the Blood of Rebbe took a few people who he could trust in secrecy and they began all the preparations. It was late into the night and they started to bake the matzah. The oven was tiny. They could only bake a few pieces of matzah at a time. The joy was extraordinary. The joy and the elation was, was something out of this world. Somebody spotted a Nazi walking towards the bunker that the commandant designated for them to bake the matzah. So the operation was halted. But one of the Jews said, no, it's the commandant, so you could continue baking. As he came closer, they looked at him and they realized he looked like him, it wasn't the same person. But basically, it was the commandant, they saw it wasn't the same person, but it was somebody who had obtained the oven for the Jews, and uh, I'm sorry, it was not the same person who obtained the oven. And uh, when he came over, they saw anger in his eyes. And he said, a letter was intercepted from this camp. I'm going to find out who in this camp smuggled out a letter. Because of this letter, I have been reprimanded and I went down in rank. He went over to the tiny oven and with a malicious stump, he smashed the oven flat with his boot. There was nothing left. It was completely destroyed. He left. They started to cry. The mitzvah was so close. 
but they already baked one dozen matzahs. They already baked 12 matzahs that they had. So now it's Erev Pesach. They have 12 matzahs. The question is, who's going to get the matzah? Everybody was starving, always. But now you have also the mitzvah of eating matzah. So they decided to discuss, you know, they get into a conversation, what to do. So they went to the Blush of Rebbe, and he thought about it. He contemplated it. And then he said, listen, those who are mechuyev, who are obligated in the mitzvah of matzah, they should get a piece of matzah, a kazayas, to be able to do the mitzvah. That's the point. And that was the decision. As this conversation was happening, a voice was heard. And the voice said two words. Binarenu ubiskeneinu. It was a woman's voice. She was on the ground, almost lifeless. Didn't look like she's going to survive. Binarenu ubiskeneinu. It says in Chumash, when Pare told pa- Moshe he's going to send the elders out of Mitzrayim, Moshe said, no, binarenu ubiskeneinu bibaneinu We're going to go with our youth and with our elder, with our sons and with our daughters. We're not abandoning the children. So this woman was screaming that Pasuk. Binarenu ubiskeneinu. Binarenu ubiskeneinu is that Pare wanted to send the older ones. And Moshe said, no, 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 we need the younger ones. We need the kids. And she said to him, she says to the blood of the Rebbe, first Moshe said, Binarenu, then Biskeinenu. First the young and then the old. So she said, if this was what Moshe said when they left Mitzrayim, with the matzahs, it should be the same way. First give it to the Narenu, and then give it to the Skeinenu. Give it to the young, and then give it to the old. He went over to her, and he says, you're right. You're right. So that year, Pesach, the matzah was given to the children to eat by the first Pesach Seder that was led by the Blaj of a Rebbe. After the war, he married her. <laughs> her name was Rebbe Tzimbrunya, and they began a new life. She became known as the Blaj of a Rebbe Tzim. In that horrible moment, she was articulating that truth. Don't give up on the children. True, children under bar mitzvah, bas mitzvah, don't have an obligation to eat matzah, only mitzvah chinuch. But in terms of giving them the fire of amuna, don't ignore them. On the contrary, if in Bergen Belzen we need the future, it's precisely at this moment. He was so moved by this, he was so transformed by it. Not only did he change the Seder, but obviously he knew that this was his, uh, his soulmate. And they rebuilt a family after the war because his first wife was killed. So here we have in summation the Kenegadar Ba Banim Dibritaira. That's why it becomes such a central piece. The Binarenu Biskeneinu. And the Baruch Hamakaim. Baruch Hu. Baruch Shanasan Taira Lama Yisrael. And again, Baruch Hu. And now you see the precision here. Baruch Hamakim for the Chacham. Baruch Hu for the Russia. It's who? It's concealed. Baruch Shanasan Taira Lama Yisrael is for the Tam. By learning Torah can experience and understand that all of life is grace. All of life is gratitude. All of life is being a channel. And then the Shani Yadei Elishal here, it's very easy again to give up. Baruch Hu. Again, it's who? The same Baruch Hu like before. It's concealed. The heart is in jail, but it's not absent. It's, be, it's behind bars. It's who? But the presence of Hashem is there. It just may be concealed. And therefore, we have to, we have to be able to have the courage and the confidence that with our open hearts, we open other hearts. Have a wonderful week and a beautiful week. And may we experience the ultimate Geula, this Rosh Chodesh Nissan. Be'ezer Hashem, next week we will have a Pesach class next Tuesday, 9.30. Thank you. Mazel Tov. <laughs> Your mother-in-law was very worried about me. I don't know why. <laughs> She told your husband you should take care of me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. I'm sorry, what? He's, he's, you know, very, he's a very determined brother, you know. Who? Um, Michael Sam. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. The sign.